Mrs. Bob Barbas just doing God's work. Sunday, get out of there. You're in danger. Hello there. Sir from 17 once again. This is my DMC, Dante Must Die difficulty, video walkthrough. This is the second part to Devil's Dalliance, and uh, we're traversing these fantastic looking luminous bridges in this pill-popping haven that is this nightclub. Uh, this encounter right now uh, is quite simple because you can knock the enemies off the edge. It deals with them much quicker. You'll notice I'm trying to, to pick him up with the, the rake ability. Because once you've got the rake ability, you can knock them away from you like that and then once you've done that you can get them off the edge and I just followed him off the edge which is dangerous but luckily enough I got back and I'm going to probably try and do the same to this guy uh, because a lot of the times when you just want to beat the game you don't have to be that stylish if you're going for score style is is very important but if you're not just just knock dudes off it's, it's so quick and if there's ever an environmental hazard in the room, use it. Oh, in a previous video I mentioned the inputs of the triggers not, not keeping up with the game sometimes and you end up doing rebellion stomps and things like that. That right then, when I came down with the rebellion after I came down with the arbiter, that was me holding the right trigger but the input not count counting. It didn't pick up on it. But that right there is bullshit and cheesy and it happens far too often. Cheeky bastards. But this is not a challenging fight compared to the ones we've done, so you, you should do this without too much hassle at all. But a lot of people are going to be a asking how does this compare to the other Devil May Cry's in difficulty, because difficulty seems to be uh, one of the things that Devil May Cry seems to bring up a lot. And I can understand it because this series is known for being difficult, and a lot of people play it for that fact. I don't think that this is the same calibre of challenge as the old ones, but that does not mean that it's easy. Uh, if you come into this game expecting it to be a, a smooth ride, uh, you're probably going to die more times than you expect. That being said, uh, that amount of deaths is going to be nowhere near as high as it would have been on the old ones. And uh, I actually left a comment earlier the other day saying that I, I've died more on the normal difficulty in perhaps the first three missions on Devil May Cry 3 than I did on this guy recording Dante Must Die. But there's a couple of things to bear in mind when I say this. Oh, by the way, this is the... The dude in the red mask is the guardian that I mentioned. He's the bodyguard of Mundus. And this sequence right now, you're actually fighting two Dream Runners, but I didn't realise. Oh, I think you fight two. I could have swear you fight two. Maybe the second... Oh yeah, there he is. Do you see him? Cheeky bugger. So one of them is a standard Dream Runner, the other one is the one with a fancy name that I can't remember. And the one with the red mask, you can't kill yet. You kill him later on, he keeps teleporting away. But it's an interesting fight, because whenever you've got two of these, and they start doing a lot of the, the teleports, you can take quick damage fast, because it's fast, and it comes out of nowhere sometimes. But my, ad my advice for this room is patience. Divide and conquer... Don't get too zealous when it comes to attacking or you will get countered. And uh, don't do that as often as I do because they knock it back all the time. <laughs> but yeah, the difficulty of this game, it's a different kind of challenge. It's a, it's a ninja theory challenge. It's, it's very similar to, to Enslaved and the difficulty on that. If you fought the enemies wrong on Enslaved, you got beat up on hard. If you fought them correctly, you could do them without taking damage, and it's very sim similar here. And I don't know if that's a, a barrier to entry for some people. Like somebody left a comment mentioning that... Can you remember when you didn't have to play the game on its hardest difficulty for it to be a challenge? Well, that statement is all good and well, but it's too subjective to, to hold any weight. Because just because you can do it easily doesn't mean everybody can. And uh, what a lot of people need to get into the their minds at this moment in time is there are demographics that these games are being made for. And a lot of the times, you're not it. Uh, you're a, a very small component in, in that demographic. Because I blame the Wii, personally. <laughs> and I blame motion controls. Because they opened the door for a, a much more casual market. 
And the problem is, the casual market outweighs the hardcore market because games have such a stigma attached to them that, you know, you get called a nerd or you get called a no-life or people tell you to go outside like they have absolutely any idea what you do with your life when you're not on the internet or you're not on your computer. It, <laughs> it just It's hilarious that they're on the exact same site as you talking about games and then telling you to go outside, which, you know, the irony of that is is chokingly funny. But the demographics are, are not what people think they are. People seem to think that hardcore gamers are, are the main audience, and they're not. They're not at all, because they're, they're literally the 1%. 99 are the casual people that never even beat the game. And they're the people buying it. They're the people that they're making it for. And I think that the motion control stuff and the Wii and, and all that kind of thing that brought in this this much more casual this much more easy going you know focus it was a gateway for the other platforms to, to mellow down as well and uh, I don't think it's necessarily too much of a bad thing because I do think motion controls in maybe five or ten years will probably be the shit they'll be what they promoted them to be before they came out and people were on skateboards with their entire family and you know waving samurai swords with one-to-one -one recognition but they're a proof of concept right now, and that's why I never really bought into them. But it's it's difficult to say that going casual is a detriment because it's bringing in a wider audience and it's bringing in the audience that they're aimed at. And when they do do interviews and things, they're not going to say we're, we're making this for the core gamers as opposed to the hardcore gamers. They're going to say they're making it for everybody that appeals to, to you know, every single type of player. But that simply isn't true, because I can give you the link to a forum that specialises in Devil May Cry and has done for a very long time, and the players on there are extremely good at these games, and I can almost guarantee you now, if you look at this on that forum and its reception, it's going to be filled with nothing but negativity. Because that's just how these people are. These people, they're like time capsules. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, because they're having fun, and if you're having fun, you know, why not? But I can't do that, and you've got to look at it from the wider perspective. Like on Giant Bomb is a good example. There is a reviewer called Brad Shoemaker. Oh, there's a witch in this fight, guys, and she makes it a pain in the ass. She needs to die. Has to die. <laughs> what am I even doing? Oh, no idea. And be careful, too. When you try and attack her, if the enemy with the, the aura around them come down, they will cock block your attack. God, they're so frustrating. I hate this enemy. <laughs> but on Giant Bomb, Brad reviewed this game. He was fearing it as well because uh, he has almost no, you know, no baggage in this genre at all because it's not his thing. So he came into this open-minded but expecting to hate it. And he ended up really liking it. And he gave it five stars. And a five-star review on Giant Bomb is a rare thing because they're not like some of the more mainstream, you know, games review websites. They do this for the love of the industry and the love of games, and they cover what they want to cover. They don't cover what people are telling them to cover. And that does make them unique. And Brad loved it. And Brad openly can see that it's a much more palatable, much more accessible version of the older games. But he also goes on to mention something that I I immediately had a knee-jerk reaction to, but at the same time it makes perfect sense. Because he is the 99%, and in this situation I'm the 1%. And what I mean by this is the statement he makes is, uh, right at the end of the review he says, Ninja Theory have, 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 have rebooted and made Devil May Cry you know, an important franchise again after it had been something along the lines of Long Forgotten and they'd made it relevant again. And to me, uh, I disagree with that completely because to me Devil May Cry has always been relevant but I'm not, you know, the the core gamer. I'm the person who, who, who has a fetish for these games because I love them. And the, the other people that, you know, play so many games a year that don't buy them, that come across them, probably don't think that these games are any good. And it just goes to show, being the voice of reason, that that is probably the majority of people's opinion on the game. And that is why I predicted before this came out that this game is going to be probably the most commercially successful Devil May Cry 
has been in a very long time because Devil May Cry 4 did not get received very well because it was a lazy game. It had fantastic combat, glorious combat, but the design was lazy. Anyhow, thank you for watching and you take care now.